Hello and welcome to Verbal to Visual. I'm Doug Neal, and today we're going to be talking about this book right here, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning. This book came out about a decade ago and has been on my reading list for a while because even though I went to school to become a teacher and have been teaching and learning for much of my life, uh, I've been wanting to have, you know, kind of a, a set of principles based in science to influence how I teach and also to reflect on the role that the skill that I teach, the skill of sketching out ideas, what that can play in the learning process. So what I would like to do today is sketch out some of my favorite ideas from that book and reflect a little bit on what they have to say about sketchnoting. I think the main ideas from this book fall into three categories that I'm going to capture as a Venn diagram. And if we capture or incorporate all three of these main ideas about successful learning, for the center of this diagram, that's where we will be giving ourselves the best opportunity that what we learn will actually stick. So I'll first share each of these three main components and then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive into each of them. The first of the three is that sticky learning is about retrieval, not review. So it's about pulling ideas from memory as opposed to just looking back at something like the things you underlined in a book or your highlights or rereading your bullet point notes. That type of rereading or review isn't helpful in solidifying that knowledge. What's more helpful is prompting yourself with some question and then having to pull that information from memory. The second overarching idea is that your learning be spaced and not crammed. So here you want a bit of separation between each time you study a particular piece of information or practice a new skill. You want there to be a little bit of time in between those practice sessions because it's actually helpful for you to forget a little bit or for it to move kind of to a deeper part of your brain so that it takes a little bit of effort that next time that you practice it because that effortful retrieval is good for you. It makes the connections in your brain stronger. The third big idea is that your practice be varied as opposed to monotonous. So here you want to kind of switch up your practice in some way so that you're not always doing exactly the same thing. You're not always practicing the material in the same way. You're keeping it interesting in a way that prevents your brain from kind of knowing what's gonna come next. It's not repetitive, but instead is varied in the way that life is varied that you don't know what questions are gonna come up, when you're gonna need certain pieces of knowledge, or when you're going to need to put to use a particular skill. So if you just wanted to get what I consider to be the three biggest ideas from the book, you want those quick takeaways, there they are. Feel free to run with those if you would like. What we will do now is pull in some specific examples and a few more of the details from each of those three big ideas. Connected to the idea of retrieval as opposed to review, the authors highlight the, am I still in frame here? Not quite, let's try that again. The testing effect. So this one I found to be interesting because quizzes have kind of a bad rap in the schooling experience as something that maybe is seen as not a particularly useful learning activity for students, maybe even kind of like a boring component of the schooling experience. But as it turns out, when you give your students or yourself a quiz where you have to pull some information from memory and uh, respond to a particular question, what you're doing is this useful act of retrieval. You're solidifying the link between 
this question and the particular answer by kind of forcing your brain to, to search for that answer and pull it out of your memory, as opposed to accessing it just by looking at what you underlined in the textbook. And this doesn't always have to be kind of the, I don't know, boring multiple choice test here. It could be a, a fill in the blank or it could be an open-ended question. And in fact, that open-endedness comes into play with another suggestion here in, in the category of retrieval, which is uh, represented here with a journal that you maybe spend some time writing in every day or regularly in response to new things that you're learning. And this is the benefits of reflection and elaboration. So this could be achieved with a journal or with an open-ended question or prompt that you might see on a quiz. But here the purpose of reflection and elaboration is a little bit more about connecting the ideas that you're retrieving to something from your own personal life, your own past, your experiences, your interests, which helps you to connect the new ideas that you're learning to ideas that are already there in your brain. Let's add an I right there. This act of retrieval might also take the form of simple flashcards where you add a question on one side or a prompt of some sort. The answer is on the back. You know how flashcards work. That's another kind of quick way of getting at the same sort of testing effect where your job is to pull that information from memory. And it's a good way of kind of accurately testing how well you know something. And this is a key point that they make kind of over and over again throughout this book. If you focus on review instead of retrieval, review is where you look at what you underlined, you read your highlights, you review your notes. It gives you the sense of confidence that like, oh yeah, I know this. This all makes sense. I will remember this when I need it in the future. That's a false sense of confidence because understanding something while you're reading it is a lot different than pulling that information from memory. So that's what these three techniques get at. These ones a little bit more rote, this one a little bit more open-ended. Next, let's talk about spaced. Here a specific system was described called the Leitner system. I forget Leitner's first name, but the person who developed this kind of encouraged you to Perhaps think about what you're reviewing um, as a, a set of boxes. So what I will draw here are, oh, uh, you might think of these as boxes to store flashcards, perhaps, as you're learning something new. And as your, your number of flashcards grow, let's say you're learning a new language and each flashcard has one vocabulary word on it, over time, you're gonna get a lot of those. You're not necessarily going to want to spend time every day with each of those. That will get maybe a little bit boring and repetitive and maybe take more time than you have. And reviewing those cards every single day is actually a little bit less efficient and effective because you're not giving your brain the opportunity to forget a little bit, to do the extra work of searching your brain for that piece of information because that extra effort is what strengthens the connections. So the way this system works is that maybe you have one box for the newest information that you're learning that you maybe do want to quiz yourself on on a daily basis. But then once you answer that correctly, maybe a few days in a row, then it can move to your weekly box. This is the information that you quiz yourself on once a week. Once you go a couple of weeks correctly answering a particular prompt, then it can move over to a monthly box. Once you have correctly answered these ones a couple months in a row, then it can move over to a quarterly, where every three months you test your knowledge. And this maybe is where it stays. Even if you keep getting those correct, you still want to do occasional review, occasional retrieval, I should say, because if you don't do any retrieval, then it is likely that that information will 
kind of completely fade into the background and you won't be able to pull it back when you need it. So maybe you set up these four boxes and you know, if you get your weekly ones right a couple times, you get to move it over, move it up to the thing that you study only monthly. But if you get it wrong here, you probably wanna go back all the way to daily and kind of start over again. So this is kind of a system for getting the most bang for your buck. Make sure that you're not studying material too frequently, but you're spacing it out enough to make your learning efficient. Only study daily the things that you need to study daily, but then even in the kind of largest space, you're still making sure to regularly practice the, the information that is still important to you that you want to be able to pull out and use on a moment's notice. So that's the key idea with spacing out your learning. Next, let's tackle the third component of keeping some variety to your studying habits. And there's two examples that I wanna bring in here, both of which involve physical skills and sports in one form or another. The first one is a baseball example. So I'm going to attempt to draw a pitcher winding up for the pitch. And then of course we're gonna have a batter over here. What might be a common practice in baseball and perhaps other sports is that, say you're, you're doing batting practice, maybe in recent games you've struck out a couple times because of curveballs. So you wanna get practice hitting curveballs. So your coach throws you curveball after curveball after curveball and you start to get really good at hitting them. Your confidence grows. You're like, hey, I'm ready now. For the next time that pitcher's gonna throw me a curveball, I'm gonna knock it out of the park. There's a key difference between that practice experience and what you're going to face in a game. And that's that when you step up to the plate, you have no idea what type of pitch is going to be thrown. You don't know when it's going to be a curveball. So in practice, what you got good at is hitting curveballs when you know a curveball is coming. But really what you need to get good at is the discrimination skills of interpreting in a split second what type of pitch it is and whether it's worth taking a swing at. So that's an example of including helpful variation in the skill building process so that what you develop are those discrimination skills so that you get good at recognizing when it's a curveball or fastball or knuckleball. So this is an example of a physical skill, but the same applies to something maybe more purely intellectual. I think an example given was someone who's learning how to identify different birds. It's more helpful to study a variety of birds, to intermix the, the type of birds that you're identifying, instead of focusing on one species of bird at a time. Because that focus on one species at a time, that's not true to the experience that you'll have when you're out on a hike, listening and looking for birds. It's the discrimination skills among different species that's more important and more useful. Another interesting example in this same realm had to do with tossing a bag into a bucket, which isn't an actual game, but is close enough to cornhole, which is what I thought I would sketch out here to make this point. With one board over here, one about right here. So when you're playing cornhole, the you know, the range of uh, where, where you are as the person throwing is somewhere right around here. I think this is true, just to the right or just to the left of your board here. What they actually found was that it was more useful to practice, not exclusively in this area, but instead a little bit in front of and a little bit behind where you actually throw. So practicing here or back over here. Folks got better at actually successfully throwing the bag into the bucket, even if the goal was to get good at throwing it into the bucket from a distance of four feet. I think they had two different groups. One group of people only practiced at four feet. The other group practiced from three feet and then from five feet. And then they both had a test where they saw how good they were at throwing the bag into the bucket at four feet. The folks who practiced at three feet and five feet were better at that task 
than the folks who only practiced at four feet. Now, the implications for cornhole might not be that interesting, but think about free throws. If the results of that study are repeatable, that means if you're practicing your free throw shots, it will be more helpful to practice in front of the free throw line and behind the free throw line and not just specifically in that one spot where the free throw line is. That's pretty counterintuitive. And I don't know if there's any coach out there that is actually practicing free throws in that way, encouraging their players to. So my hope there is that those kind of extra examples give a little bit more depth to these key ideas of focusing on retrieval instead of review, spacing out your learning instead of cramming, and making sure that your learning activities are varied instead of monotonous. If we start to think now about how that applies to the development of your sketchnoting skills, one implication is that you practice drawing elements that are in your visual vocabulary, not by looking at a reference, but seeing if you can draw those things from memory, and then practice different categories of drawings and diagrams together, as opposed to just practicing drawing people, and then just practice drawing notebooks and pens, to maybe mix up the category of drawings or diagrams or writing styles, because that's what you'll be doing in a sketchnoting session. You're not only going to be drawing people or only writing words, you're gonna be doing it all together. So weave that variation into your practice. I also think it's helpful to think about what the creation of a visual artifact like the one behind me now, what that facilitates in the future as it relates to solidifying new information and helping you apply strategies or ideas you learned in the future. If you think about that retrieval process, I think it's easier to retrieve a picture from your mind than it is a bullet point list or key ideas within a paragraph. So one thing you might practice retrieving from memory is something like this full sketch note. That's what I enjoy doing, especially with the books that I read, is if I'm out on a walk or going for a run, I find it helpful and interesting to think about a book that I've read in the past year or past couple of years. If I created this sort of visual summary of it, I try to piece together that visual summary in my mind as I'm pulling in those key concepts from the book and applying them to what's going on in my life at that moment. I like to use books like these as a lens through which to view my current actions or the, the current thing that I'm dealing with. So I might ask myself, what would the book Make It Stick have to say about the way that I'm teaching the skill of sketch noting and encouraging others to develop this skill? What would the book What Works by Tara McMullen have to say about how I'm thinking about goal setting for 2024? What would the book The Psychology of Money have to say about how I'm thinking through my financial decisions? And while yes, I could simply review my past notes as I'm thinking through those things, I do like the idea of being able to pull that from my memory in the moment when I'm making various decisions and having a visual like this that I am over time kind of embedding into my brain through spaced retrieval, I find that to be an intriguing proposition and something that's kind of fun to work toward. If you too would like to develop the skill of sketching out ideas to deepen your learning of the books you're reading or podcasts you're listening to, conferences you're attending, I encourage you to check out the resources at verbaltovisual.com. There you can find a full library of courses to get you up and running with this skill. And I hope that you found this particular visual summary to be useful for your own learning, perhaps your own teaching. So I wish you luck in implementing these ideas to whatever skills or knowledge you're developing right now. And I look forward to sketching out more interesting ideas in the next video. See you then.